As we dive deeper today into the biography of David, we're going to discover a man who thought very differently uh, from the world around him. You know, people who believed that, that they would earn his favor by doing something wrong are going to be in for a surprise. And, and people who expected David to rejoice at, at the destruction of his lifelong enemies are going to be surprised to see him weeping instead. David reminds us that as followers of Jesus Christ, our thinking, our priorities, our perspectives should be very different from the world's. Our minds are to be focused on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Now, by no means, beloved, was David perfect. He was, in fact, a sinner, just like you and just like me. And that's going to come out here in these opening chapters of 2 Samuel. Now, as the third chapter of 2 Samuel opens, verse 1 gives us this news. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. David's family is also expanding during these six years. Six sons are, are born to him while he's still in Hebron. Sadly, this is the result of David taking six different wives. Now, some people try to defend his polygamy here, but David is violating God's ideal for marriage between a husband and a wife. Just, just keep reading, by the way, and you'll see that some of David's sons listed here in verses 2 through 5 They're going to bring into the kingdom, into his household, murder, rape, revenge, and even treason. Polygamy, beloved, always brings suffering and jealousy and division into a family. Now, we're told here that the house of Saul, under Saul's son, Ishbosheth, well, that's becoming weaker, that house. But this general is becoming more powerful. And when General Abner takes the step here and takes a concubine of Saul and for himself, Ishbosheth confronts him. Well, Abner gets mad and changes sides. He writes to David here in verse 12 Abner sent messengers to David, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. Well, David agrees with Abner's proposal on one condition, that Abner bring David his first wife, Michael. And and tragically, that's what Abner does. He, He literally takes Michael away from her current husband and sends her over to David. Abner then encourages all the leaders in Israel to give their allegiance to David. And this leads to a conference of leaders here at Hebron where Abner makes this promise to David in verse 21. I will arise and go and will gather all Israel to my Lord, the king, that they may make a covenant with you and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. David, we're told then, sent Abner away and he went in peace. Well, when, when David's general, Joab, returns to Hebron and finds out, you know, what has happened with, with General Abner, he isn't happy about it at all because Abner had killed Joab's brother years earlier in battle. So Joab tries to convince David that Abner is up to no good. Apparently, he's unsuccessful in convincing David because he has to hatch his own plan to lure Abner back back to Hebron without David's knowledge. And when General Abner shows up, assuming that General Joab is, you know, just going to let bygones be bygones, Joab murders Abner. Joab gains vengeance. But he's also eliminated a, a, a growing potential competitor for his position as general in David's army. Now, when David learns what Joab has just done, he wants everybody to know that Joab is guilty of this murder. He also wants everybody to know that he had nothing to do with it. 
So he says to the people here in verse 31, tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and mourn before or for Abner. Verse 37 records, all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner. Now, we have every reason to believe that David's sorrow is genuine, but it was also politically important that everyone know he had nothing to do with the murder of Israel's great general. See, that might have caused the northern tribes of Israel to refuse to follow David as their king. Well, the, the death here of General Abner guarantees the downfall of King Ishbosheth. And as chapter 4 begins, verse 1 tells us that his courage failed and all Israel was dismayed. Now, if we haven't had enough murder and intrigue for one lesson today, there's more to, to take place. Two Israelite soldiers decide that David is going to become the king and it's going to be to their benefit to kill King Ishbosheth themselves. They enter the king's house at midday when he's resting and they kill him. Verse 7 says, they put him to death and beheaded him. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron, and they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. Oh, let me tell you, they've misjudged King David. David tells them here in verse 11 that they've killed a righteous man in his own house, and with that, he gives them the death penalty. David is a warrior, but he's also a man of honor and justice. Murder is murder. Whether David stands to benefit from it, well, that's irrelevant. David isn't about to allow this assassination to go unpunished. It reminds me that the driving ethic in the world today is this, the end justifies the means. Do whatever you got to do to get ahead. Step on people, move them out of the way, crush them, slander them, just get over them and make it to the top of the ladder. Well, David isn't immune to that kind of temptation here, but we see him demonstrating a godly perspective and an absolute trust in God's timing. He's confident the Lord will fulfill his promises to him and, and establish him as Israel's king. More importantly, David knows that God doesn't need his help. Well, since that day when Samuel anointed young David to be Saul's successor as king of Israel, David has showed the utmost respect for those in positions of leadership, even, even when they didn't you know, earn that respect. You remember how he refused to raise his hand against Saul? You remember even when Saul tried to kill him, David wouldn't return that? And, and here now the king, King Ishbosheth, has been killed. Watch David demonstrate amazing grace here in chapter 4. In fact, let me go back to verse 4 that reads, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now, this verse is loaded with meaning. Let me break it down. Although Saul and his son Ishbosheth have opposed David, David refused to take revenge on the house of Saul when he became king. Saul's son, Jonathan, had been David's closest friend. And now here we're told that Jonathan has a son who survived all these years, but he'd been injured in an accident. David now shows kindness to this disabled young man named Mephibosheth, and he will eventually invite him to live in the palace with David and his family. Imagine the strong sons of David coming to eat at the dinner table, and then here comes that shuffling sound of Mephibosheth's crutches as he limps into the dining room and joins the king's family for dinner. Oh, let me tell you, this is a picture of you and me, disabled by sin, crippled spiritually, but delivered by the grace of God, invited to the king's table as a member of his family. And that's a family, by the way, that's going to last forever. 
Well, until the next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.